And had international law been respected, at least in the last 12 months, this would have stopped. It should have stopped. It should have been stopped by the Security Council last October. It should have been stopped uh, after the first set of uh, provisional measures issued by the International Court of Justice. It should have stopped when I presented my first report. It should have stopped before Rafa was invaded or before the invasion of Lebanon. And instead, the silence, or worse, the justification of a small but influential number of states has continued to enable and to, to nurture the hubris that leads Israeli conduct as we, as we speak. And how do we explain the, uh, the fact that the Palestinians from the West Bank have been exposed to the same practices and abuses, often rape, among other forms of torture, um, than those in Gaza, if there was no Hamas military action or presence in the West Bank, not that the, 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 the first justified what Israel has done. To be very clear, I don't think that Israel is the only state that attacks special rapporteurs. Special rapporteurs get attacked when they uh, scrutinize the human rights records of member states. Uh, and there are states who are more vociferous and virulent than others. What is striking in the case of Israel is that, is that there is a cohort of states who echoes and reverberates what Israel says and does. And, are, and there is a, an army of minions at work to, um, to uh, produce literally fabrications that have one and only one objective, to distract the attention from where it should stay. And the fact that Israel has never faced any consequences. And indeed, I do believe that the impunity that has been granted to Israel has allowed it to become a serial violator of international law, which is the reason why I recommend that this is the time, as it has been for apartheid South Africa, to consider, uh, for the General Assembly, to consider uh, the, um, the suspension, I mean, recommending the, the, the revision or the suspension of Israel's credential as, uh, credentials as a member of the United Nations. There is no question that the Palestinians have the right to resist under international law, like all people who are oppressed and who cannot enjoy the right of self-determination. Um, I just presented my fifth report, um, third to the General Assembly, which has a very uh, harrowing title, Genocide as Colonial Erasure. And as I say in the first lines of the report, this is something that were, walks on the heels of my previous report, which I presented to the Human Rights Council in March this year, where I concluded that based on my findings over five months of investigation, there were reasonable grounds to believe that Israel had committed acts of genocide in, uh, in Gaza. And I've continued to investigate what has uh, happened in Gaza, but also the rest of the occupied Palestinian territory after presenting that report. I, um, I can say that for over one year, I've pleaded all concerned, to all concerned parties, uh, particularly those states who can exert more influence on the state of Israel, to take concrete actions to stop the destruction of Gaza, the destruction of the Palestinian people, to ensure the prompt and unconditional release of all hostages, both Israelis and Palestinians, and to ensure international law is respected. And had international law been respected, at least in the last 12 months, this would have stopped. It should have stopped. It should have been stopped by the Security Council last October. It should have been stopped uh, after the first set of uh, provisional measures issued by the International Court of Justice. 
It should have stopped when I presented my first report. It should have stopped before Rafa was invaded or before the invasion of Lebanon. And instead, the silence, or worse, the justification of a small but influential number of states has continued to enable and to, to nurture the hubris that leads Israeli conduct as we, as we speak. The developments on the ground are, are gruesome. And uh, it is long, it has, actually since the beginning, the, 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 the violence, the genocidal violence that I have described in my first report uh, has expanded and metastasized in other parts of the occupied Palestinian territory. And if you look at the patterns of violence, the destruction of civilian infrastructure, roads, energy grids, uh, uh, water pipelines and reservoir homes, and if you look at the numbers of extrajudicial killings in the West Bank as well, on top of the 42,000 Palestinians who have been killed, a certain killed in Gaza, including 17,000 children. How do you explain the 700, over 700 Palestinians who have been killed in, uh, in the West Bank, including 170 children? And how do we explain the, uh, the fact that the Palestinians from the West Bank have been exposed to the same practices and abuses often rape, among other forms of torture, um, than those in Gaza, if there was no Hamas military action or presence in the West Bank, not that the, 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 the first justified what Israel has done in Gaza. But again, not only we see the past reproducing itself in the occupied Palestinian territory, we see the same indifference, the same uh, ability to look away of uh, many member states in the international community, and we see a total collapse of the international order, which is premised upon the never again that was promised after the Second World War, and particular, in particular after the Holocaust and the genocide of mostly Jewish people. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to take your questions. I don't know what, um, what, else, what else to say other than um, it's not been a, an easy year because surely it has been reluctantly that I took on the, the functions of chronicler of a genocide. And it's extremely disturbing to see member states pontificating and questioning and um, and uh, obscuring the meaning of international law and dehumanizing the victims of this, uh, of, this last, of this last 12 months. But however, should you have any questions? I'm here. Yeah, you do. OK. Um, we have Abdel Hamid. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Abdel Hamid Sayam from the Arabic Daily Al Quds Al Arabi. Thank you for coming again to talk to us. I have a few questions. First, you have been personally attacked, as always the case, when someone criticizes Israel, then they try to attack that person personally, like Graham Bull with Onurwa, Lazarini, now Karim Khan, uh, and many others. So how do you uh, take these uh, personal attacks on you? And the second, as you know, international law allows people under occupation and foreign domination to resist. I mean, they become heroes. I mean, we have a statue of Mandela here, and because he was uh, resisting apartheid, many of the great leaders of modern time were at, at one stage fighting colonialism. Why only when the Palestinians fight occupation, they are labeled as terrorists? Thank you. Um, to be very clear, I don't think that Israel is the only state that attacks special rapporteurs. Special rapporteurs get attacked when they 
uh, scrutinize the human rights records of member states. Uh, and there are states who are more vociferous and virulent than others. What is striking in the case of Israel is that, is that there is a cohort of states who echoes and reverberates what Israel says and does. And, are, and there is a, an army of minions at work to, um, to uh, produce literally fabrications that have one and only one objective, to distract the attention from where it should stay. So I will not entertain any discussion about how I take these attacks, because they're not just against me. They have been against the special rapporteurs on the occupied Palestinian territory who preceded me. Uh, and this year, in particular, the Secretary General has been vilified and even declared the persona non grata, welcome to the club. And, um, and uh, so the General Assembly, what is more shocking to me is that this year, the United Nations have been under an unprecedented military attack. 70% of UNRWA premises have been hit by Israeli fire, and uh, which has also hit peacekeepers in Lebanon. And uh, the United Nations uh, humanitarian functions have been hampered at the, at the moment where they were the only bulk, at the bulk work to continue to provide assistance to the, to the Palestinians in extreme, in an extreme situation of distress. And it's because of that that I, I do believe that while Israel is by no means the only state that violate inter, violates international law, and it's not even the only states that violate that violates uh, the right of self-determination of a people, but it's surely unique in the determination, the the the, the, the protractedness of, uh, of this conduct and the fact that Israel has never faced any consequences. And indeed, I do believe that the impunity that has been granted to Israel has allowed it to become a serial violator of international law, which is the reason why I recommend that this is the time, as it has been for apartheid South Africa, to consider, uh, for the General Assembly to consider uh, the, um, the suspension, I mean, recommending the, the, the revision or the suspension of Israel's credential as, uh, credentials as a member of the United Nations until uh, it ends uh, violating international law, and until it withdraws the occupation, uh, which is clearly unlawful also by determination of the International Court of Justice, and surely uh, until it continues its genocidal attack on the Palestinians. Um, you and then Mike. Hi, my name is Ibtissam Azim, Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. Good to see you again. Um, I have two follow ups. First, on the issue of suspension uh, of uh, Israeli membership or uh, to the UN. If you could elaborate on that and uh, whether you believe this is something that will get um, a majority in the General Assembly. Um, and then. Um, my other question is regarding a third party's role in the war that's going on, uh, whether it has to do with uh, delivering weapons. Uh, I mean, their responsibility when it comes to international law uh, and the lack of uh, mo uh, them taking any steps uh, and, uh, in, in, uh, and basically supporting. So the accountability for not only for Israel, but also for third parties. And uh, the last thing, in your remarks today to the committee, you talked about the lack of empathy that you are seeing by some member states uh, in uh, not um, um, even expressing um, any empathy for the Palestinian victims. Uh, and uh, could you, and also the issue of uh, the many states um, talking about human rights in academic um, a context or theoretical context, but when it comes to the issue of Palestinian human rights, uh, they are even attacking uh, students, they are not allowing uh, or attacking uh, people who demonstrate against the war. If you could also touch on that, thank you so much. 
Thank you. First of all, I should uh, briefly respond on the second question. Sorry, I missed it. Um, regarding resistance, and I think I've said it before, including in this uh, in this venue, that there is no question that the Palestinians have the right to resist under international law, like all people who are oppressed and who cannot enjoy the right of self determination. The right to resist is to a people. Um, what the right uh, to self-defense uh, is to a state. And uh, in the same way, it has limits. So it cannot, neither um, can touch civilian life. Civilian life is sacred than should always be protected. So um, I, I think that we should always remind ourselves and respect, respect the fact that October 7 has been uh, an unspeakable tragedy for the, for the Israelis who call, who call that event uh, the worst terrorist attack they've ever suffered. And as I, I've said before, for me, those were surely war crimes to the extent they, they targeted, that they hit civilians um, and should have been met by justice. This didn't legitimize the attack on the on the uh, on the Palestinians. Like uh, um, like if they were the nation responsible, because they were not. And again, this should have prompted a reflection on the causes, on the root causes that have led to that horrific day, uh, which is a horrific day both. For the Israelis and the Palestinians, I want to underline. Although um, I think that this is not the, the day the genocide of the Palestinians in Gaza started. And um, um, is it is it correct that only the Palestinians are denied of this uh, this this right? No, I don't think so. I think that after. Uh, um, then after 9-11, there is a, an, in, an increasing uh, intolerance for, for people's claims for self-determination. And again, we are no longer in the decolonization era, uh, where the right, of, uh, the right to resist was, to an extent, even celebrated, to an extent. We are in an era where uh, resistance is seen, is often seen and labeled as terrorism. This is the reality for the Palestinians and others. Um, concerning the the suspension, so there are there are different issues there. Uh, but um, what I what I refer to is Article Six of the UN Charter, which says that when a member of the United Nations persistently persistently violates the principles containing, contained in the UN Charter, it might be expelled from the organizations and there should be, from the organization and there should be uh, a decision of the General, Assemb a General Assembly upon recommendation of the Security Council. Um, there have been cases where the impasse of the Security Council has been circumvented by, by by a decision of the General Assembly to act, uh, for example, uniting for peace. And this might be one opportunity to consider in this case as well. But I would like to take this opportunity to stress that again, this is not animo what prompted me to make that, that rec recommendation is not the fact that Israel violates international law full so. Israel vi violates international law from its birth and international law includes UN Security Council resolution and General Assembly resolution Israel has violated, including the UN resolutions that it committed to abide by as a condition to become a member of the, of the General Assembly of the United Nations and uh, orders or, and decisions of the International Court of Justice. And again, this year, the escalation of violence and attacks against the United Nations sets a terrible precedent that if left unpunished, might also encourage other states to resort to the same kind of venomous reactions toward the, the, the United Nations, losing all respect 
all respect for these organizations, and this should not happen. This is why I think it should now, it, it's time to take an exemplar step. Um, consider, considering, wh why did I mention the lack of empathy? Because I have, I don't know if I'm, I have the fortune or, fortune or misfortune to always present my reports to the General Assembly after the Commission of Inquiry. Um, which has a team of investigators and so carries out a very thorough uh, work of uh, collection of evidence. And again, for the third time, I heard the member states criticizing the mandate of the commission, which means they don't even interact with their counterparts uh, in, in Geneva who have toned down their criticism toward the commission and appreciate the work it does instead of engaging on the substance. And I've heard member states mentioning again October 7. I understand. I mean, I, it's not that I, I criticize that. But it, like, like if history started on October 7, forgetting the 56 years of oppression and, uh, and the tens of thousands, if no more, Palestinians who had been killed, let alone the one million people who had been arbitrarily detained, including many children. So. It's it's a bit preposterous, and and the, the fact that seventeen thousand children have been killed, and this was not even mentioned, together with the full destruction of Gaza, I mean, it made me realize that no, life is not worth the same, and Palestinian life is less worth. This is for some member states. This is a fact, and I'm and I'm also annoyed by the fact that this issue, which is so sensitive to, to, to millions, I mean, because again, the life of the Palestinians first and foremost, but also the life of the Israelis, may, for many of them, is hell since, uh, since last year. And there is this uh, sort of, uh, let's speak aside, attitude in the General Assembly, one side and the other, that again, it, it bears testament to the to the loss of humanity that has uh, penetrated this, uh, this institution. The comment I made on human rights and, is, and the fact that there has been uh, an erosion of the value of human rights in the last 12 months was prompted by the fact that um, member states who Member states who uh, praise themselves as defenders of, of human rights and sponsors of human rights, including in their international relations, have not hesitated, have not uh, have, have engaged in forms of repression and cracking down fundamental freedoms of their own citizens. And in Europe, including of Jewish people who are standing in solidarity with the Palestinians for what they were going through. And this is very, uh, it's very telling of the of the bizarre time we live uh, we live in. But especially when it comes to students who are, in a way, the most powerful, but also the most the most powerful. They've been the most powerful voice speaking truth to power. But also they're still the most the, the most frail part of the society because they are investing a lot in building their future. And many of them have have seen their future. Uh, undermined, sacrificed for standing for justice, and what kind, of, what kind of message are liberal universities in the liberal West sending to the students? Yes, we can teach human rights from our um, from our podiums in universities, but then don't dare fighting to have them becoming a reality for all because this is not your job. Basically, this is the message that is being sent. Third party. Uh, third party responsibility is uh, there is a clear obligation uh, which is general a general principle of international law law of state responsibility when there is an international wrongdoing of any sort violations of international law human rights law international humanitarian law uh, any state has the every state has the responsibility not to recognize the legal consequences of the wrongful act and not to engage, not to aid and assist uh, in the commission of the wrongful act, but rather acting to, um, to uh, lead to the cessation of the same and, the, and ensure reparations.
Nothing of this has been done. But now we are also in a context where, as the International Court of Justice has recognized the possibility of uh, uh, the genocide uh, could be committed already in January, this uh, triggered the application of the Genocide Convention, meaning the obligation to prevent genocide, for which you don't have to wait to have acts of genocide fully completed and a people or a group completely destroyed. You need to act so that genocide doesn't take place. And so an arms embargo was, uh, was a clear obligation the day after the court has passed, has uh, issued those provisional measures. Instead, the international community has, uh, has followed Israel on its uh, attack against UNRWA, and so has continued. I mean, member states continue to trade uh, with Israel and to transfer weapons.